Thanks, guys. So um, thank you very much for having me. I actually heard today that you've never had a Googler speak at the Dev Fest in Vienna, which is, of course, a tragedy. And um, so I was talking to some colleagues, and they said, well, uh, someone has to go there. Who can we send? And they sent me, so you're stuck with me. Unfortunately, um, I am not a, an engineer, but I'm... Um, a develop in developer relations and business development. So I work a lot with engineers. So hopefully I kind of understand the, the problems of engineers and um, the language. So I'll, um, I'll try and teach you a little bit about app distribution and revenue models for apps. So that's mobile apps. Um, and I'll kind of limit my focus onto the Android platform today because um, I'm from Google, right? So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of who I am. So that's Google. That's the whole team. And that's the guy <laughs> with the red uh, circle around his head. That's me. Um, I'm actually a, an economist. So as I said, I, I don't know much about how actually to build amazing apps. But um, I help people who have built amazing apps make a lot of money with it. So um, I've been at Google for almost three years. And um, I don't just talk to a lot of big develop like sort of big developers in the DAC region, but I also try to go to events like this or for example to the Google launch launchpad event that was happening in Berlin um, a few weeks ago to kind of mentor startups. So obviously they don't get me in to talk about, I don't know, their back end infrastructure but um, about how to make money. So I'm based in Dublin. And um, my team is called OPG. We all have very cryptic names. Um, it stands for Online Partnerships Group. So um, that's kind of where the, the, whole, the whole approach is. I'm trying to be a partner to developers and help them um, develop. So just to, to start things off, I just want to see like kind of who's in my audience. How many of you guys, either for work or for pleasure, develop mobile apps, so Android apps? OK. Great. Perfect audience. Okay. And um, is it mostly Android, or do you guys also do iOS? <laughs> iOS development? One guy, really. You don't be shy. Don't be, sh <laughs> don't be shy. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about Android mostly today. Um, I was um, at uh, the launch pad about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Uh, Launchpad is kind of an event sponsored by Google to help startups, like very early stage startups that haven't really found product market fit to um, really work on their product, narrow things down, throw things out, um, work on their technology and also work on their um, monetization and marketing strategy. And there was a great speaker. His name is David Katz. He's um, from Israel. And um, he was kind of teaching us about the first day and what to do with our startups because I was there as a, as a mentor. And he said, look, um, you have to build something great um, that actually delivers value. You've got to find someone that wants to use it. Then you actually have to reach them and you have to generate money. So um, I'm going to be talking about the, the last two things here today. Um, what do I know about a lot? So we have these, so in the kind of department that I work in, we have these very fancy slides. They seem to very much like the, the round things like wheels and stuff like that. And basically, they list all the products that Google offers to developers and um, all the great things people can build with it and how they use it. And um, I mostly work with analytics on apps. So um, my motto is kind of, if, you, if you're not really using analytics, or any kind of analytics solution, ideally Google Analytics, I don't really want to talk to you. Um, I work with um, the monetization products a lot, which is AdMob for the ads monetization, uh, Google Wallet, and um, also Google Play for uh, mobile commerce and um, sort of digital monetization. So um, if you, I'm going to be around for the rest of the afternoon. So. If you guys have any questions or you want to talk to me um, about any of those things, ideally those three things, so analytics, um, play, and ad mob, I'm happy to, I basically want to meet everyone here, so um, come and talk to me. 
obviously if you've got questions about other developer tools, I'm probably the wrong person to ask, um, but you know, if you want to talk about social stuff, YouTube, um, I, can, I, I can try to answer your questions or um, maybe find someone at Google who can answer your questions. Um, so, as I said, I'm the first person to speak from Google at, um, at DevFest in Vienna. And it's actually the first time I'm trialing this to come to a very technical audience to talk about monetization, okay? So I really need your help, which is feedback, right? So um, it was very hard for me to judge how to balance my talk. So um, I think I erred more on the side of giving you ideas of what to do, but not necessarily talking about how exactly to do it technically, right? So I'm kind of the ideas guy. You have to, you have to implement it. But if you think that, hey, I don't come to DevFest to hear about ideas like that, I want to know how to do it, give me that feedback at the end. There's gonna be a form. Um, and I'll try and, for the next DevFest I speak at, I'm gonna try and adjust the talk a little bit, right? So you guys are kind of guinea pigs. Oh yeah, and um, I was expecting to give the talk in German. So I kind of raided the corporate branding slide deck, right? You kind of get these slide decks that are very corporate and look very fancy, and most of them are in English. So some, is, some of it is gonna be in German, some of it is gonna be in English, but whatever is in German, I'll try and translate. So this kind of means let's go, right? A love introduction. Anyway, yeah, and interrupt me with questions if you want. We'll see how that goes. I don't know how noisy you guys are, how much questions you have. If it gets too much, we'll um, push them to the end. So before we get started, any questions? Nothing. Okay. Perfect. First topic, app revenue models. It's a jungle, right? So if you're building an app, and you've thought a lot about kind of what app you want to build, what your value proposition is, what your, the product is that you're shipping, then you need to make some money. And there are loads and loads and loads, loads of ways to make money. And I love talking about all of these ways, okay? So I work with developers in mostly very large ones all throughout Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And they have, not all of, the, each of them has every model, but I think in the work that I do, I cover every single um, revenue model that you can think of, and I might even have forgotten some. So some developers want to make money selling their data. Um, some, you know, just use the app as a kind of value add for some, some, some other service that, that you're selling. So for example, I installed those Wi-Fi controlled light bulbs in my house the other day, and there's an app for that, right? So there's no direct revenue from the app, but it powers some sort of other, you know, it helps sell another product. Um, some apps focus on lead generation. So I could talk for 10 hours, and all of you guys would be asleep by the end of it, because I've got interesting ideas on most of these things, and, you know, some experience dealing and advising my developers on how to use them. Um, but basically what I'm gonna do, just because I think it kind of focuses the talk more, I'm going to talk about any kind of Google Play related monetization mechanisms, so like the um, in-app purchases and the, the subscription models, and also about advertising. And if you have questions around any of the other things, you wanna talk to me later, feel free to, you know, find me. So yeah, analytics, IAP, and ads. That's basically what I want to, what I want to talk, talk about. So if you have questions around Google Wallet or um, anything else, speak to me later. So the cool thing is, this is my first kind of like technical thing. Um, you can do all of these things. You can implement analytics, you can, you can do ads, and you can do all the kind of in-app purchase monetization things via the Google Play services SDK, right? So that hasn't been like that forever, so I hope everyone has already heard about it. Don't want to, you know, be teaching to the, preaching to the choir. But um, basically you don't have to install any, any additional SDKs or anything like that. Um, 
to do everything with Google, on, on Android at least. Um, talk a little bit about, about audience first. I am, um, as I said before, if I talk to um, a developer, the first thing I say to them, what kind of analytics are you using? Are you doing any analytics, right? And I always get, or I often get this response, even from, um, so mostly I don't work with very early stage startups. So this statement is probably true for early stage startups. If you, you know, you kind of want to have some sort of measure of activations and of retention, and then you're fine. So then you're just building your product, you're making, you know, if you've got a good retention rate, you're doing something right inside the app, but you don't necessarily need to spend resources at the beginning figuring out exactly what it is that you're doing right. But if you're you know, growing and you want to start really going deep and optimizing, um, I don't really want to talk to developers who don't want to track anything else, who don't want, want to really go deep into the apps. Um, some of the... Some of the things, I'm, I'm going to, you know, obviously you can do a lot with analytics, but um, some of the things I want to, um, want to focus on is segmentation of users. So that's very, very important, and you'll, I'll get into why. Um, also kind of, you know, understand what do people do in the app, how, you know, how do they interact with it. Um, also measuring revenue, very important, and how to measure different kinds of revenue. Um, and this is, I think, something that people a lot of developers don't do enough, is um, kind of the testing of, well, making testing and A-B testing and little adjustments and optimizations easy. So there's an interesting story I wanna, wanted to tell you about. Um, I work with a large dating app in, um, in the DAF region. And they have a problem, right? So a lot of their male users are not getting contacted as much as they would like to be contacted. Okay, so I think, I don't know if that's a secret to anyone, but that's a problem in dating apps, is that, um, yeah, usually the, the girls don't really want to reach out to the boys as much. So they are really tracking in analytics um, how many sessions a, user, a male user has had without being contacted, right? So they can really clearly see like at what stage people start to drop off and not use, you know, when, the, when does their loyalty start to, to wane, right? So, you know, if you open the app, you don't get any contact requests, kind of gets boring, you're sending out contact requests, you're not getting anyone contacting you, so then you stop using the app. So what they actually do, or what they could do is they could experiment with changing the algorithm that surfaces the profiles of people who are not getting contacted on other people's home screens, right? Or, so that would be one kind of fun thing that, that they've been trying to do. Or another thing could be to offer these people um, premium memberships to, um, you know, and sell it to them like, oh, you know, you'll be more visible in the network. So th these are just little ideas that, that have been coming up. And um, that's why whatever important metric, you know, interaction metric that's happening in the app, um, really keep an eye on it and I think it can explain a lot about what users do and then it can also have a huge impact on um, optimizing your revenue if you really find what's driving people or what's stopping people from using the app. Um, this is kind of, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, basically analytics integrates very well with Google Play and um, that's also quite new, so I don't, didn't, don't know if everyone knew about it. Um, there's some stats that I don't know if they're wide, widely known. So Google Play says there's about 12% of daily active users on the Play s Store search for apps every day. So that's quite interesting. I don't really search very much on the Play Store, but um, they actually enter search queries. Um, and about 50% of the daily active users um, search weekly. So if you have that Google Play Analytics integration, you can really work on optimizing your landing page and playing with the keywords you have in your landing page or in, on your app detail page to, um, to drive some traffic. Then, this is one of my favorite topics, actually. 
It's Google Tag Manager. How many of you have like worked with Google Tag, Tag Manager before? One person, two people. Great, three people, perfect. Um, Google Tag Manager is also part of the, of the Google Play Services SDK. And um, basically what it allows you to do is to change things or set up your app in a way that you can cha make changes to the app without releasing a new version. And most critically is, of course, not just making changes, but also testing the changes, right? So um, I work with um, a utility app. Um, they're being, they, the developer sits in Toronto, but um, they're registered in Germany, so I work with them quite closely. And um, they r launched the app about 18 months ago, and for a year, had absolutely no way of making money in the app. They didn't have ads, they didn't have any kind of upgrades or in-app purchases, anything. So the guy came to me and he's like, Max, we have this app with about two million active users a month and it's great, we're getting a lot, of people use the app every day because it's designed to be used every day, but I'm not making a cent. So what we did is we defined so we, for multiple reasons, we, we decided on advertising as a uh, revenue model, and we defined a lot of um, ad views in the app. So basically, the whole app was full of ad views, but we deactivated all of them. So then we released the app in the Play Store, and via Google Tag Manager, we could switch on different ad views for different you know, target groups or for you know, different countries and test um, and in the end, we actually settled on, on one specific implementation that uh, didn't seem to bother the users. It's mostly interstitial driven. And um, now he's, you know, he can, you know, let's say one month he wants to have a little bit more revenue, he can dynamically switch on the ads without having to re-release the app. And he's all doing that via Tag Manager. Um, there's um, actually a lot of my guys are using this. so. Um, there's, I also manage this kind of like a, a TV guide app, and that guy does the same. He actually, he can, using Tag Manager, he can switch between a lot of different ad networks um, uh, without re-releasing the app. So it's very kind of dynamic and, and quite user-friendly. So if you're looking for something new to test, this is actually one of the big areas that I, that I like a lot. Do you have here? Oh yeah, <laughs> lifetime value. Um, this is kind of for the first half hour. Right? Um, this is kind of a, a beta that isn't public yet, so um, we don't really, I don't know, we haven't talked about it much, but this is definitely coming. So at the moment, calculating lifetime value is very complicated. Usually you have to do a lot of research, which means you need to spend time, time that you can't spend developing or improving the product. Um, you need to come up with a model that you think fits your app quite well, and usually it's all done in Excel or whatever data crunching program you use. So um, basically, so if you think that your app has potential to be promoted, sort of if you're, if you're going to spend marketing budget on your app, you pretty much want to know how much can I spend per install or per user that I'm acquiring? Um, and so you kind of need a prediction for um, for the value of those users so you don't spend too much or too little, so you spend the optimal amount. And um, this is all going to be automatic in analytics. So I don't know how many of you are doing lifetime value calculations, but you can stop spending time on it and just tell analytic, analytics to do it for you. Um, and it's, I don't know how well you guys know app analytics, but there's the um, multi-channel multi funnel setup, and um, it's going to be like that. So basically you can select between, or you can compare different lifetime value models and see which one fits best for your purposes. So it's really going to be quite flexible. That's it for um, analytics. I just want to quickly see, like, are there any questions or comments? You, 
can use it on your website as well, yeah. There's but there's an app version. Okay. As well. uh, yes. But what you what you can do is you can um, have sort of obviously you can have default settings for when there's no internet connection, right? But when there is, then you can ask the when once the tag has loaded in the app, you can ask for certain parameters that have been set and decide like what color should my menus be today, or you know where should be my um, call to action buttons, what size should it be, and stuff like that. So you can run very detailed experiments with it. Really, like you let your imagination run wild, right? You could um, run tests for different acquisition channels. So if you're, I don't know, um, you know, you have acquired some users through, um, I don't know, uh, an incentivized ad network or something like that. You could do different tests with them, see how if they respond differently to certain incentives in the app. Um, if you have any kind of login information, you can use that as well, right? You could change the app according to gender or you could track, um, you know, you can have different experiments for gender. So whatever you can track, you can pass into this into this tag and make the answer, con so the configuration setting conditional onto that. Okay. Cool. So I want to talk a little, about, little bit about in-app purchases and what you might notice is that I'm going to go through kind of, there's some <laughs> evangelization slides. I'm going to go through them quite quickly. And I'm going to focus on a couple of key points. So if your, whatever your I ideas are not covered, ask me afterwards or um, come, you know, during the talk or, or talk to me afterwards. So this shouldn't be a secret by now. Um, most of the downloads, so more than 90% of downloads um, are free downloads. So people don't like paying for downloads. So we're in 2014, about 140 billion App Store downloads um, this year, nine, over 90% are free. Um, so I'm not saying there are no paid downloads, but the app has to be pretty damn good for users to wanting to purchase it, right? So it has to have some kind of unique value. Um, just a question, so for all of your apps, do you think your app is good enough that it should be pay for download? Yeah. seems to be a valid valid criticism. I, I don't know about how many crash reports you guys have in your apps. So um, actually, I forgot to repeat the questions. That was hard, hard to repeat though. Um, so basically there was a, sorry, I'm speaking to the recording wow. device. <laughs> um, there was a, a comment about that Android being um, very crashy and buggy and that that might cause people not wanting to pay for apps, okay? So that might be true. But this chart is actually not just for Android, it's also for iOS. So the, the trend to free downloads is definitely there, yes? Is the 
actually, I don't know the exact split, to be honest, I have to, I have to say. Um, this is aggregate data, though. Okay. But I can try and find out if it's something you're really, really interested in. Um, actually, so I wanted to go through these slides quickly, but it didn't work that well. Um, so this is just quickly. So this is um, sort of purchase intent on the App Store, which says, like, how likely are you to pay for an app to download it, or how likely are you to pay for an in-app purchase after you've downloaded the app? And that's quite, um, so that's for gaming apps. But that's quite strong. So like over 90% of users in these countries, well, not in France, they seem to only be at 88%. But um, basically, ba the point I'm trying to make is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of potential and a lot of revenue potential to be had in, um, in having some sort of well-working in-app purchase mechanism. But there's a problem as well. Um, and that is, I think this is, I think, Google internal data, I'm not quite sure, um, is that in general, only 15% of users across all ca app categories ever, like, make a purchase once a month, okay? So 85% of users don't ever purchase anything, whether it's in-app purchase or pay to download, right? So really, like, whatever mechanism you're working on, it has to deal, <laughs> you know, appeal to those 15%. Of users, um, actually, I got this one. This is aggregate numbers again, so I'm just going to translate it. So that's um, this year, so 2014, roughly 25% of revenues um, come from in-app purchases and 10% from ads. Okay, so that means a lot of money is still being made with pay-to-downloads. So even though it's less than 10% of downloads, a lot of money to be made, but Projections are not long in the future, so 2017, 50% of revenue is going to come from in-app purchases and 15% um, of revenue from um, ads. So try to really think about making those mechanisms work. Um, it's quite interesting. So I'm not going to go into all the details because it's also very small. Uh, writing, but basically the main the main message is that a very small group of users in games generates all the revenue. Okay, and maybe one key takeaway for you guys: about 40% of gaming users don't ever spend a cent. Okay, so the gaming users are more happy to pay. Okay, for in-app purchases, but still 40% of them will never pay any, you know, buy any anything, any virtual goods. Um, and I think these slides will be handed out probably, so you can have a look at all the detailed numbers. Um, another thing I want you to take home with you today is that timing is super important, okay? And timing is important for the decision to buy an in-app to make an in-app purchase. So a very small number of users will buy something in their first session. It actually takes a lot of sessions for users to become um, comfortable of making a purchase, right? So a lot of users, almost half, will wait 10 sessions until they're ready to buy something. Okay, so I want to drive home this one point, which has sort of, it's worked for me in gaming, so for, for, for gaming developers that I work with, and it's worked for me in almost every app category that I deal with, and I deal with pretty much every app category, um, which is, they call it authorization. You guys probably heard about it, but it really works well in terms of trying to maximize your in-app purchase revenue, right? So do you guys, do we have something to write, like to draw something? Perfect. Um, this is like basic economics, so I don't want to bore anyone, but like, so, very, very basic, right? Price, quantity of something bought, right? So high price, low quantity, low price, high quantity, right? Very basic. So it's like a relationship like that. If you have a very small number of uh, people, users who are willing to buy, to make in-app purchases, and you just, I don't know, offer them some sort of basic price, then you're making this much money. But if you could figure out a way of really 
like if you could get the users to reveal how much they're willing to pay, okay, um, you can set different price points. and make much more revenue, right? And for this, you need a way of figuring out exactly at which point someone is willing to pay how much, right? So an authorization is a very good way of doing that. So what I was saying about analytics, I said I'd be talking about um, segmentation again, right? Really think about how you can segment your users and try and identify which of them will never buy anything, which will, of them will buy something but at a low price, which of them at a high price, and, you know, try to... Try to be as precise as possible. One way of doing that is, you know, maybe, you know, you need basically uh, information to condition on, right? So some information could be this person has, has bought something before. This person has played the game in the last 24 hours. They do a lot of commenting on photos or whatever it is, or they've had 10 sessions. So I think they, they're ready to buy something, right? They're loyal now. So whatever works for your app, I know it's, Stupid. Maybe you're looking for like a you know a recipe that works for everything. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. But because it's very individual to the app. But try to define the variables that you think will help you find the actual price points, and then track them in some sort of analytics platform. So one. Mm. So one way of doing this is just from a, a gaming example. It's like if you have. Um, you know, someone playing your casual game a lot, then they get to a level they fail a couple of times, you show them an ad for an in-app purchase that they can make to unlock that level or give them extra lives or whatever it is, right? And you try and set the price specific to what you think that person is willing to pay, right? So if you know whether they're male or female, you might know that women are, m you know, are willing to pay a higher price to unlock a level. You might send them a, a different offer and a different price point that you might send for a man or people from different countries or whatever. Be as specific as possible, and then you get as close to kind of the, the willingness to pay curve of your users as you can. Um, what do you do with users that you know will never pay? You know, you might have shown them an ad for an in-app purchase a couple of times. You show them an ad from another company instead, right? So you're try you've tried to sell your own goods for a while, didn't work, you show them an ad. Oh yeah, and this is some, some research that we did showing that if you do both in-app purchases and, app, uh, and ads, you make more money than if you use the, the different revenue mechanisms independently. I don't know, I didn't do the research, so I haven't forged it myself, so I'm not trusting it. All right. Do you guys have any questions on that? And I saw some people talking and discussing. If it's like a super long, detailed question, wait to wait till the end. But um, any quick comments? No. Perfect. We can go be pretty quick like, with this. If you want to do banners, don't talk to me. Um, do interstitials or native ads, but interstitials for now is where most of the programmatic demand is. So, one interstitial, you remove five banner views, you make more money, okay? And I don't know if you're interested in, um, in the reasons, but oh, it's a full screen ad, sorry. Yeah. So, you show one full screen ad, you can remove pretty much all other advertising in your app. Um, but you have to be smart about it, okay? Don't let me start the app. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm just going to read about some football news. And as soon as I get to the article, I get a full screen ad. I'm going to be pissed off, right? So show it to me at points where it makes sense. Yeah? Maybe um, if it's in a game like between levels or where the game is loading. Or, um, I don't know, after I've commented on an article or after I've closed an article. Or, I don't know, after I've uploaded a photo or whatever, like whatever, you know, makes sense. Not, maybe not at the beginning of an article, but at the end. So, you know, so I'm not pissed off that it's not disturbing my, my user flow, okay? Another good tip is try to include 
splash screens in your app. So if you're, if, you're, if you're thinking about using ad monetization, include splash screens with interesting information. You know, like, I don't know, after I finish the level, like, give me some feedback on the level. So then the users get used to seeing important information on splash screens. And then if you show them an ad once in a while, they won't be pissed off. Um, also, in the pipeline is, um, oh yeah, so video content, okay? So regardless of whether you have video content or um, you don't, try to show some video ads, okay? I know it's a bit of, you know, tricky and think of them a little bit like interstitials. So show them at times when it makes sense, when the user has um, good internet connection, maybe on, only on Wi-Fi, only on fast Wi-Fi, um, and don't make them wait. So one mistake, and I don't know, hopefully none of you have made that mistake, but a, a thing that kills ad performance and also then the user experience is if you don't do caching of ads, right? So make sure the ad is fully loaded before you show it to a user, okay? Stupid, I don't know why I have to say it, but it happens all the time. Okay, uh -huh. how much time am I gonna spend on this? This is super, okay. I'm going to be very quick on this. So this is mediation. So basically it means you don't trust in one ad network or one demand source for your ads. You, show, you try and you know, get as much demand for your ad space as possible. And you can read up on this on the AdMob website. I don't need to get in on a talk. Um, you know, I don't have to give you a talk on this. But what I do want to talk about is one thing that's working very, very well for me. So I'm going to give you this advice. Um, ads, ad space, are a little bit like in-app purchases. Remember how I was talking about um, you need to kind of figure out the, the real valuation of your users for an in-app purchase and try and, you know, come set the price as high as possible or as low as, you know, as high as you possibly can to still have them willing to pay? Well, in this case, with ads, the ad networks or the, the advertisers are your customers, right? So, the one thing, and this, not many people know this, but the one thing that they really care about is how often they're showing an ad to a unique user every day, okay? So if you don't take anything home from this talk, but this information is quite powerful, okay? So, all campaigns that run have frequency capping that's set per day. Okay, so they might say like, I want to show this ad to this one person, to, the, to max, three times a day maximum. Okay, this means that in auction-based systems of which AdMob, for example, is one, the first impression has the most competition for it, right? Because it's very likely that I haven't been targeted by this campaign or that campaign. So the first impression is the most valuable. So do whatever you can in your app to you know, maybe have a counter of some sort that counts how many ad impressions of this one user have been shown that day and then set different price floors depending on the number of impressions. So if, if it's my first impression that I'm seeing today or that you're showing me today, make sure you're asking for a very high minimum price and then for the second, a little bit. See, it's like this willingness to pay, right? For the first impression, it's likely that someone is going to pay a high price and so on, right? So, um, and this works very well. I've, um, I'm testing and have tested this with um, a lot of the big developers that I work with and they love it. So the most important kind of dimensions are the format and medium, of course. So like interstitials pay better than banners, video, pay, video ads pay better than interstitials. Then also the country is very important, right? Because like say, US, UK, Germany have very high um, prices that advertisers are willing to pay. And then, the, so the counter of how many impressions that user has seen that day. Okay, and if you want to, I don't know, find out a little bit more about how to actually do this, um, let me know afterwards and I'll, I'll show you. Distribution. Okay, any questions around that first? No, it's like, um, so the first thing that happens is if you want to show me an ad in an app, is you send an ad request to the Google servers or whatever network you're using, okay? 
And um, as soon as that ad request is sent, it triggers an auction. So you might get, in Germany, you might get like six, you might get 600 auction responses, which is basically advertisers telling Google, I'm willing to pay, I don't know, a euro for this impression to, to deliver my creative to the impression. And then once the auction has decided on who is the winner, um, it will ping the winner and say, now upload or deliver your creative to that app. Okay, so that's an impression. So as when, I've, when the user has seen an ad, that's an impression. Okay, and usually um, campaigns that run on our backend usually have a frequency capping of between three and five impressions for that campaign per user. Okay, but I might have been already on Facebook and I might have seen that ad already. I might have been on, um, I don't know, build.de or whatever, I've seen that ad already. So when I come to your app, it might already be the third time that I, that I see it. And then if, if you want to... Google knows that in that app. Google knows how many, so the frequency capping... <laughs> <laughs> okay. But only if Facebook is also using Google as their Yeah, so basically all the ad networks are using um are using the uh app uh, the device identifier, not the device but the what's it called? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no not that. That no. no. IDFA. Okay. Uh which is kind of the the new way of doing it. You're not allowed to use the actual hard coded identifier but a user resettable identifier. Okay. And yeah, we'll do the other questions afterwards or come and chat to me. Um, distribution. Okay, so this, this is specifically for Google Play, okay? Um, all the stuff that I'm gonna say, but it probably works in a similar way for iOS as well. Um, this is a bit of philosoph a philosophical point, okay? A lot of people that I talk to, especially when I talk to like a startup event or you know people who are just getting started with app development, they're trying to solve like a problem that's in their neighborhood or in their country, right? So no matter how good your app is or how amazing your you know your coding skills are, you're never going to you know really scale, be able to scale because you're really just targeting I don't know the whatever it is, you know, like you're building an app for, to solve the homeless problem in Vienna or whatever, you know, you're, it's very hard to think about. So basically you have, an, as a, so, sorry for being so, I don't know, melodramatic, but really like you can build something to solve a problem in Brazil and Brazil has like, I don't know, 300 million people, right? And probably as many smartphone users as there are people in Germany, right? Or in five times as many, smartphone users as they're in, in, in Austria, right? So when you're doing, when you're thinking about your project or what app to develop next, really think like globally, right? And I, I have examples of, you know, people who, sometimes you're lucky, you build something and you think, oh, I'm building this for Austrian users, but, and then suddenly you wake up one morning and 99% of your user base is in Turkey and you're like, wow, you know, I'm doing something right there, but what is it? I don't know, why does it? And I, I have a guy, like a, it's, a, it's a utility app from Copenhagen, and they, um, yeah, they built something for, for Denmark, and then now 98% of their traffic is in, the, in Turkey. And they responded to it really well, right? They made a Turkish version, and they have all these deals with Turkish distributors and stuff like that, so that's great, but what if they, I don't know, had really thought, you know, thought about it and uh, from the start, maybe they'd be even more popular. There's another app, like a, a dating network for truckers. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't start off as a dating network for truckers, right? They were like, oh, we're kind of this game discovery platform, rah, rah. And then one day, they're at their office and there's like a huge truck parked outside of their door. And there's a trucker, you know, taking photos with, like selfies with them and the logo behind them and they're like, well, maybe. And they did some investigations and they found out that it's very popular for truckers. But globally, so that's good, right? Okay. Now, I'm going to give you some advice on, um, sorry, there's no text here. The text is in the, in the notes, right? So you're just looking at pretty pictures so you can concentrate on what I'm saying. But anyway, um, 
when you develop for Android, and I hope most of you, you know, kind of do native development for Android, um, don't break the navigation principles of Android and don't break the design guidelines, okay? You can use like very unique design elements or design, you know, what, you know, if some of the unique value of your app is delivered by the user experience or the user interface element, keep that. But don't ever make it feel as though it's just been ported from iOS, okay? Um, optimize for all the common tablet sizes. And by the way, I'm giving you the kind of the criteria that a lot of the decision on whether to feature apps in the Play Store are ba based on, right? I'm not saying that if you do in, like all of this, you're going to get featured, but if you don't do this, you're never going to get featured. Um, optimize for tablets, okay? So um, I don't have my tablet with me, like a Nexus 7, I think I have. And, um, and then there's a new one, right, coming out. So think about, like, anyone doing testing at Google, testing out your app and seeing, like, if it's a cool app, they're going to have one of those Nexus tablets. And if your app doesn't work on that tablet, that's a problem. Um, keep your app packages as small as possible um, and use, you know, kind of dynamic loading of content if you need to add extra levels or whatever. Um, and really, like this, really, it's a big point. Only ask for permissions that you really need, okay? Um, if they feel that in any way spammy the, implement, the permissions that you're asking, um, that's not a good sign. Also, um, you should aim for four stars and above. Okay, obviously you can't control how many stars you get, but in terms of like getting a reputation on play and with Google as a really cool developer, stay above four stars. And there's a lot of things that you can do um, to stay there, right? So um, have some sort of feedback mechanism. I, don't, I know you guys probably hate this. Like you're, use, like you're in the middle of using, I don't know, LinkedIn or something, and they're like, oh, do you like LinkedIn? And you're like, oh, fuck, it's just been writing a message. I don't want to rate LinkedIn. So there are loads more creative ways of doing, asking for feedback. So I'm using this app called RunGap. I don't know if you, any, have you heard of it. They have this little slide. Like if you go into settings, it has a little slider and it says awesomeness on top and then it's a slider and then you can slide back and forth and it's, you know, if you slide all the way to the right, it says like, wow, you think the app is awesome? Do you want to give us feed, you know, want to rate us? So then they take you to the App Store uh, or to the Play Store. If you go all the way to the left, it says like, oh, what's wrong with the app? Do you want to email a tech consultant and, you know, help us? So try and be innovative about this kind of stuff. Um, and also something that I always get asked to include in these talks is like, try to use the beta testing functionality in Google Play, right? So um, you can have alpha testers, beta testers, and you can also do um, staggered releases once you, you know, you're doing updates. So um, any of the comments or ratings you get while you're still in beta, don't um, get added to the, you know, the public comments and stuff. So if you find any bugs or your app is crashing all the time, the baby, I don't know what it was, the baby monitor app, um, you, can, um, you can fix the problem. And it's also a really, really good way, and I've never really thought about this like that, but um, it's not just a way to, to catch bugs and to, um, you know, to improve the quality, but you can also really work on your monetization mechanisms, right? So let's say you have an idea, I was talking to a startup before, and they're kind of they're in the recipe space, right? And they're they were thinking of offering some recipes for free and then offering some like bundled and you have to pay for them. And it's a really big gamble, right? Because recipes are kind of a commodity out there. You do any quick Google search, you find recipes. So they're doing beta testing to see if it works and what works, what price points work, what kind of bundles they have to use. And, it's, and they figured out a way to monetize it, which is good. Um, also, this is a quick point, um, use, if you, I don't know how many of you are developing a game, but if you develop a game and you pu publish, it on, publish it on the Play Store, use Google Play game services, okay? If you don't, it's going to be pretty hard to get, um, 
get Google to notice you and to, to feature and all kinds of things like that. What's this? Ah, these were kind of some points. Um, think about. So these are a couple of like little like a mix grab a grab back of things that have been have been working for me quite well. So one thing is quests on Google Play game services, which is basically a way to reactivate users. So if you're having if you have a game um, or even gamification in a game, you can you know say like if you I don't know complete ten levels by Friday, you get some extra points or in-game currency or something like this. And these quests get actually pushed to users in the Play, um, Play Games app. So it's a way to reactivate users. And some of my developers have been finding that very useful. Um, also, app indexing, it requires a website, though. So if you don't have a website, app indexing doesn't work. Have you guys all heard about app indexing? Yeah, it's like if I'm doing, if I have an app installed on my phone, I do a Google search, and the content is in the app, not on a website. I, it opens the app, and it actually opens the relevant screen in the app. Quite cool. Um, oh yeah, and then the viral hook. Um, it's very difficult to do, um, and you have to be careful not to be spammy. So um, it's actually probably the last thing I'm going to say about it. So it's, um, it's a way of getting your users to engage with their friends or net social network who are not yet users of your app. And it has to add value to both of them, so to the, your user, to their outside network, and it also drives traffic back to your, you know, gives you installs. So it's very, very hard to do because the hard part is adding value to your users to, and to their friends. So I'm working with a, kind of an app in the weather space who have a very powerful mechanism around that. So really do some research on that. Um, it can help you, help you get really like an ac acceleration in your, in your users. Okay, this is kind of obvious. It's like a, if you have more than one app, cross-promote the hell out of your apps, right? Um, it's actually, there's a theory that there'll be these kind of evil app empires that d will dominate all the stores. I don't know if that's tr gonna happen, but they say like they just cross-promote each other and then you know, users won't be able to escape their world garden. But if, you know, it's a useful tool. And if you have some brand designers at it, it looks like that. Um, but this, oh yeah, this is like bartering. I'm sure you've all heard of that. It's like in AdMob you can do these barter deals. So if you all get together and cross-promote all of your apps, then that's a pretty, you know, you could be that evil empire I was talking about before. <laughs> And it's free. Okay. Um, also, some of the stuff I've been talking about is in the App Developer Business Kit. You find it there. There's a link. I, you can click on it. Um, some of these, I don't know, if uh, you know, if you didn't like the way I was presenting it, and you need to get a different take on it, um, this is quite useful. And that's it. You didn't even have to show me the last card. Um, Perfect, zero. Um, so we didn't have time for questions at the end, but please, so thank you very much for having me. Um, please, if you have feedback, you can give it to me straight afterwards or uh, talk to me. There's also, if you copy that, there's a feedback thing. There's also, if you use that form, you can, and you want to, I don't know, talk to me uh, you know, when I'm not in Vienna anymore, um, you can send me your email address and I'll try and get back to you. And there's also my Twitter and um, Google Plus things, but they're also linked, so if you get your hands on the presentation, you can use that. Thank you very much, guys.